now there's more what we would class as show whores who basically will move around and do any show for anybody as long as it's the right show so from a society perspective <laughs> are you a show whore um I from have, a society... i've been known to be Hi guys, welcome back to Winterfall Conversations. I'm so glad to be joined today by the chairman of Harrogate Operatic Players, Mr. Richard Lill. Richard, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm very good. Now, uh, what I want to know is how did you first get involved in theatre? Well, I may have just dyed my hair blonde, but um, I am getting on a bit, to be perfectly honest. It was only to cover the grey. Um, I started in theatre when I was six, and that, that was when I was in Cubs. I then went through Cubs, Scouts, Venture Scouts, went on to be a leader, and all the way through that time I did gang shows, and I also did some school productions, but that's really how I got involved in theatre, I suppose. Then I took a long break when I actually started working and my career, and I went, moved down to London. And it was only when I moved back up north that I sort of came back to it, really, I suppose. Yeah. But, but could you tell us about some of your show experiences from over the years? What shows have you done? Well, there's, there's so many. I mean, I, I started, as I say, with the gang shows, and then I think my school one was uh, Midsummer Night's Dream that I did. Um, and then I've done uh, Gigi, Me and My Girl, Oklahoma, uh, 42nd Street three times. Um, uh, the Boyfriend, uh, No No Nanette, God, I'm trying to remember them all now. Um, uh, Mac and Mabel, there's, there's, I, I did it for solidly two shows a year for quite a lot of years, so there's just endless, endless number of shows that I've done. Do you have any personal highlights from over the years, people you've worked with, shows you've done? I think show-wise, the first show that was really a personal highlight was me and my girl, because we were the first ones to do it in the UK. Um, and I played the Honourable Gerald Bolingbroke, because oh, yeah. I am not cut out to do the romantic lead. Mine's more the comedy one, with a face like I've got. Um, so that was a good one, because we it was so new to the amateur stage, but also... We went to Homburg's, which was in those days, and they they did all our costumes made to measure uh, because we were the first. The only problem was I had a pair of plus fours in one of the scenes where I had to do a knee slide, and every single performance, I burnt the knees out of my plus fours, which then the wardrobe mistress then was not very happy with because they had to down my knees every single, after every single performance, let alone the carpet burns that I looked like I got like some cheap tart, I suppose, um, were walking around with carpet burns for days afterwards. Um, I suppose that was one. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, it, it then goes on to sort of when I just moved into wardrobe and things like that. One of the highlights, I think for me, was when we did Sister Act. It was one of the hardest. You would think that it was an easy show to do with just 25 nuns all dressed the same, but the costume changes are ridiculous when you've got 25 nuns running at you and they've got 30 seconds to change the tabards and you've no idea who anybody is because they all look the same in the dark. But the highlight was I made from scratch the Sweaty Eddie costume, which is three costumes on top of each other with a two second costume change, which is done on stage each time. So he, start, he starts off as the policeman with the whole policeman's jacket, the shirt, the tie and everything, and then changes to like a sort of John Travolta in white trousers and red shirt and tie and jacket uh, and waistcoat, and then goes back to being the policeman. So it took a lot of doing to get those three costumes on top of each other, and they were in four pieces so that they just literally pulled and they put them straight inside the coat. Um, I remember the first night of that one um, when we did it and it worked, thank God. Um, the moment it happened, the audience leapt to their feet and I cried like a baby in the wings because I was so pleased that it had happened. And it did that every single night. So it was brilliant, was that? So that's probably one of my highlights. 
um, yeah, I would say the, those are those are some of the ones anyway. Uh, one thing that goes hand in hand with theatre is brilliant performances, all that, but also mishaps. So on stage, backstage mishaps. Do you have any from over the years? <sighs> okay. Um, two of them involve splitting trousers. Um, I was doing Crazy For You, and if, <clears throat> if anybody's ever done Crazy For You and you do I've Got Rhythm, it's 12 minutes long. Um, we were, as most amateur theatre companies were, short on boys, so it was supposed to be done with 12 and it was done with four of us, so we were on, off and getting changed and all sorts. But I remember we had to wear like these tight jodhpurs and then we'd tap dance on the on corrugated iron. First thing that happened on one performance, my tap flew off and went in and hit somebody in the orchestra pit because uh, it got caught on the corrugated iron. And that <laughs> I can't remember which member of the orchestra it actually hit, but it did draw blood. Um, but then we had to do like this section, which was like Cossack dancing, where you to sort of drop down and then onto your heels. And in the middle of one of the performances, my trousers went right up the back, totally split, seemed to waistband. <clears throat> and it was only halfway through. So I remember distinctly, literally running my finger up my bum crack and pushing the trousers in and then completing the routine by nipping my bum cheeks together for the whole routine because <laughs> otherwise <laughs> and that was in the days when we used to wear like jock straps and things so it wasn't necessarily my pants that were going to be on show um i did a warm-up for when we did the way to scallop in gg i think it was and just as i was about to go on and my trousers split on the warm-up um i had to run down to the dressing room and get back very quickly with another pair of trousers over the top which made it quite difficult to dance I think one of my favourites, though, was when we did 40 Seconds Straight, and it wasn't me. Um, the scene where they're all in their underwear and they're in the carriage, and the, the carriage gets struck and pushed back up stage, and it goes into blackout, and the girls had to get out of the back of the carriage down some ladders. One of the ladies thought she was actually on the ladders, but she wasn't. She'd stood on the top of the piano that was in the wings. <laughs> Um, and basically just went um, head over heels, straight flat on the floor. Um, there's, there's been so many. I think there was, when we did Betty Blue Eyes, that was a good one. Yeah. We had a, a moment, we, we used to deal, we, used to, we had a very, very, very talented guy. I won't give you his name because it would be really awkward for him, uh, who was actually playing the meat inspector. You could probably work it out if you looked it up. Um, and he used to get later and later and later for his entrances. And this particular time, his cue line went and he had not even appeared in the wings. The door, the sliding door flew open on the wings. He literally didn't break stride, leapt down the stairs, hit the door straight through and managed to do it. But as far as we were concerned, the rest of us, that was sort of... Mm, sort of problem moment where we thought we were going to have a bit of an issue. Um, 42nd Street, we went on the opening number where the, the, the curtain comes up to knee high and you're doing the big tap number. I and mean, it was at the Royal Hall and the Royal Hall has a really big rake on the stage and we, we flew down into one knee, jazz hands outside and I kept sliding and I was heading towards the orchestra pit Fortunately, the two girls that were on either side of me put their arms out and formed a bit of a barrier and stopped me from going in the pit. But there's thousands. I mean, that's what makes theatre so absolutely brilliant because for our perspective, for us as performers, the audience never sees all that. They see this fantastically polished situation, um, but they've no idea what actually goes into making it happen and I suppose the worst kind of show would be the show that doesn't have anything like that in in, in it because yeah. as performers and everybody involved they're the moments that make it so special yes some of them are very scary but 
they do make it really, really special. And they're the kind of things that when you sat around a dinner table five years later, that somebody can't help but drag up that moment yeah. when you forgot a line or you your trousers split or you fell over or whatever it was. But they're the I think they're the kind of things that bond everybody together a lot more. Yeah. So you mentioned all the stuff that goes into making a show. You're actually on the committee for Harrogate Operatic Players as the chairman and the wigs and costume master. So could you tell us a bit about that? How did it come about? Do you know, I was thinking about this. Um, I'm not sure whether I did it voluntarily or whether I was bullied into it. Um, I think what it was, initially, I've always been, when I've actually been playing a character, I've always been one to put the detail in. So like when I played in Me and My Girl, um, I put cufflinks into every single shirt that I actually wore and I wore a buttonhole for every single costume because that's who he actually was. And some of the things never really get noticed or seen by the audience. But for me, it was a way of actually um, sort of bringing the character to life and feeling better about that character. So I used to do a lot of alterations to my costumes <clears throat> and then what would happen after costume call, I would get, can you take this skirt up? Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do the other? And I'd literally be working overnight, trying to do every, all my friends' uh, costumes. And I think it sort of started a bit from there. Then, like with a lot of societies, um, you have a very sort of core of older people and they tend to retire or it just gets too much for them. And I, because I was doing so much myself, I then started doing it for other people and I started doing it for other societies. And I think I then created my own animal and destiny. Um, I got too good and therefore people wanted me. So I'd, I've worked with four or five other societies where they bring me in to try and consult on it or help out or do whatever. Um, and I think for me, the best part is solving the problems. And I know, because I came to see you, you played Kips. Yes. Unfortunately, we were supposed to play Kips, but yeah. due to COVID, we had to cancel the show. And I know that from our Kips, Rich, his perspective, we've got 19 costume changes to do for him. And I would never compromise the show for a costume so I would make it work um whether that be with velcro magnets poppers you name it whatever it took to actually make it work so whilst retaining the integrity and the authenticity of the show um so I, I enjoy when somebody says to me I can't make this change and I'll go how long is it and I'll go 25 seconds and I'll go you've got time to do your hair in that time for god's sake and cross over the stage. Um, so anything less than sort of 15 seconds, I would class as quick. Um, anything 25 to 15 is is a bit dicey. And anything over 15, then do it yourself and get to your dressing room. You've got plenty of time. So I think it was resolving those kind of things that, that, that I enjoy. And obviously we're doing Kinky Boots next, and um, that's got some serious costumes in it. Yeah. Uh, which I've made all the finale costumes already. I've made yeah. them, obviously, with not actually having a cast, um, but I've made them so that they nearly fit me, because I worked out that basically none of the angels or drags queens should be any fatter than I am if they're going to be going on stage. So if, if I can get in them, then I can take them in to make them fit. What is your uh, creative progress when you're designing these costumes? Like, where do you draw inspiration from? Do you do original ideas? I think it's it's a combination of both things. I mean, you can't deny that when they do something in the West End, Broadway or whatever, that they've got the best ideas. But it doesn't mean to say that they <clears throat> have to be taken so literally. And I try to understand when I look at the costumes from any show that's been done, whether whoever's done it, I try to understand why they've made that decision. Um, is it to do with who the character actually is? Is that what they would wear? Is it something that's more logistical or practical that they can't, 
you know, they, they've got to wear something that allows them to do particular dance moves or whatever. So I think I sort of start from that perspective and also then it's from the audience. Um, I can liken this to, I had a very big birthday party. It was a big masquerade party and I spent an absolute fortune on it. Um, and I had lots of things and a lot of detail in it. But the three things that people remembered afterwards is the food, the naked butlers, uh, and the LED dance floor. They weren't naked, naked. They were the butlers in the book. Now, I spent a fortune on flowers and all sorts. So I think I apply that kind of philosophy to the costume plot. You have to look at what, from an audience perspective, what do they actually see? What do they remember? Um, and then take it from there and put the detail in. And then the second part of it is, are there any practicalities for the for the for the cast for instance in kinky boots there's the scene where the all the drag queens arrive at the, th at the actual factory and they're all in overcoats but they then go into a massive dance routine so all the ones i've just done they've i've had to make them look like overcoats but then they're all split in four places so that when they do a high kick it doesn't sort of pull or ride up or anything else um and then i think the other process that I do more than anything else is put the detail in so when we did Betty Blue Eyes I think I had over nearly a thousand items in the show from clothing to accessories so every girl was issued with a coat because that's what they had one coat a headscarf they all had a brooch they all had a handbag they all had seam stockings and they used to laugh because every night before we went on before the curtain came up, they, it starts with them all facing the back of the stage. So the first thing that the audience sees is the back of them. And I used to go along and I used to actually on my hands and knees and I used to straighten every seam in everybody's stocking before they would out, before I'd allow the curtain to go up. So it, original ideas, it's difficult sometimes to actually sort of come up with them when with amateur theatre, what they're actually looking for in a lot of places is they've seen it professionally and they more or less want in some ways a carbon copy of it. Yeah. It's down to the West End people to do a new contemporary version of Oklahoma where there's no set and everybody's wearing a black thong and a bonnet on their head or something ridiculous because they can do it. With us in amateur theatre, we have to try and be, I suppose, as true to what the audience expects. You can put little twists on things. I've got one costume next to me right now, which is for the referee one in Kinky Boots. Um, and it's based upon what they have, but it's nowhere near the same. And the same with the other ones for the finale. There is, there's one that you have to have in, and the other ones are versions of what they actually have done in the West End. So it, it's a long process. The other part that you have to take into consideration is who's playing the part. You know, in an ideal world, like say for instance, your, your chorus would all be five foot nine and size 10 and 13 waist boss and, and everybody looking pretty much similar. But the reality is, um, that most of the times you've got fat, thin, tall, short. Um, so you have to come up with a costume that's going to make them. I think everybody that works with me, they trust me to make them look the best that they can for who they are and what they're playing. That's probably one of the biggest compliments I could probably have is that I would never put somebody and make them feel uncomfortable. But at the same time, I would have to insist that if the part dictated that you wore a pair of hot pants, you shouldn't have gone for the part if you knew that that's what it was going to be. So uh, yeah, we all have to have, I've had to do it myself, where you have to wear something that is not what, it's way out of your comfort zone. But for me, when I was performing, the moment I put the costume on and put the makeup on, it was never me. It's just you're playing a part and nobody's looking at you and judging you for who you are, they're judging you for who you're playing rather than the other way around. 
Brilliant. Uh, I just have one last question for you. Uh, what advice do you have for anyone wanting to get involved with theatre or costume? What advice do you have? I would say be willing to do anything. Obviously, excluding the casting couch. Um, <laughs> learn, learn everything that you can. Uh, and understand that you never, ever know everything. And the one determining factor of the whole thing is respect everybody and the show must go on. So if you want to decide to do wardrobe, understand what's involved in that. It's not, you don't even need to be able to sew to do wardrobe. You just need to have the vision, the organization and be able to delegate to people. I mean, I'm fortunate I do a lot of sewing myself, but it's to do with plotting, it's to do with understanding how the show goes. And I think, um, going back to that, I, I helped out on Fame recently and everybody had their rehearsal gear and I said to them, where's the rest? And they said, well, what do you mean? So we've got uh, this number's in rehearsal gear and this number. You have to understand that when you're doing something like that, that, that if you go home, you would not come back in the same clothes. So they were made to change because from an audience perspective, you got to try and take them on that journey, which is a horrible word, but take them on that journey of, have they gone home? Is it another day? Where are they or whatever they're actually doing? But as far as getting into theatre, I think the one thing that you need to have is a real desire to do it. And that doesn't have to be on stage. It has to be a, um, a real sort of, more or less, it's like a physical kind of ache of wanting to be involved in it. I would literally spend my life either on stage or backstage if I had a choice. And if I could wind back the clock, I probably would have done more than that. Um, I did have a very good opportunity recently, last, not last year, that's that's a year that we've wiped from our memory. The year before where I've got quite a few friends that were actually in the West End and one was working on, one was in 42nd Street. And I just managed to get the opportunity to actually work for a month backstage. Unfortunately, it never came off because just as we were about to actually do it, they decided to do a cast change. And with a cast change in a show like that, they couldn't have a passenger sort of, hanging around whether I was making tea or not. Um, so I think it's take every opportunity and it's a bit like being a performer. Always accept that you're never too good to go on the back row and always accept that you're never too good when you're working backstage to get somebody a glass of water to literally let them spit a sweet out into your hand because they've got a cough sweet in. And it's just, really just understanding that whatever it takes to make that the best it possibly can be, then as everybody working together, that's what you have to do. And and look at different things. I mean, I'm believe it or not, I'm actually doing the Noda summer school oh. wardrobe course next year. Oh, What's going really? this year? Yeah. I know, it was quite funny actually, because um, <laughs> I don't know whether you know um, Christine Castle, she actually said to me, are you teaching it? And I went, no, no, no. I said, do you always have to understand there are people that you will meet that will let you know something that you never knew you didn't know. And that's the thing. If you can do that and being chairman of a society that's as good as Harrogate Operatic Plays, it's a privilege. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard job because nowadays our shows cost about 40 to 45,000 to put on. So it's a big risk. Um, and trying to make that. And the, I think the biggest difference now is before you had a core where no matter what you decided to do, they would always do it with you. Now there's more what we would class as show whores who basically will move around and do any show for anybody as long as it's the right show. So from a society perspective <laughs> are you a show whore? um I am. I have been known to be from a society perspective you you're now balancing between what your audience want and what your cast want 
um, whether they'd be interested in doing the show. Um, that's the thing. I mean, we're fortunate with what we've got with Kinky Boots. So we've, we've got a lot of interest in Kinky Boots. Um, so I'm expecting high hopes that hopefully you're going to come along and slip on a pair of boots and uh, a corset. You never know. Oh, you never know. Being a show whore, you can be, being a show <laughs> whore, you can now be a drag whore as well. <laughs> well, I was, I was meant to be with you guys as the understudy uh, last you year. You were, you were. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you, you were supposed to be with us as the understudy. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, well. um, it was a shame that it never actually went ahead. Um, one day. And you one did day. a brilliant job in what you actually did. Uh, yeah, still got that um, bloody yeah, banjo. One day. You never know, we might go back to it. Still got the bloody um, banjo. I've so. got Rich's banjo. Um, <laughs> we, we still took, we took him a long time to actually um, get, he wouldn't give me it for a long time because he just couldn't, he was too painful to actually give up on it because of, we had to give up on the show, obviously. Uh, but yeah, it's um, it would have been good. It is a good show. Um, I will say the the thing as well with all the things that we've been through, there's been a lot of companies and things that have been very good and very supportive. Um, MTI were very good regarding all the license and the rehearsal material and everything else. And they've been very good with Kinky Boots and everything else. Um, but yeah, it's it's been a challenging year for, for everybody it was 2020. And I think the hardest part it's just not being together. Yeah. Doesn't matter whether you were singing, dancing. I mean, we were fortunate. We did. We were probably the only society in Yorkshire that put on a show in 2020 uh, during the pandemic. We did Musical Squares in November. Um, it was hair raising. It, we did it um, and it charted the uh, uh, 2020 COVID year through musical theatre, which was brilliant. But the best part about it was just being in the same room as everybody. Yeah. That was the thing. Well, I'm very jealous about that. So, Richard, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm honoured you asked me. Oh, sorry. I'm honoured you asked me and it's been brilliant. It's not been quite as terrifying or... I don't appear to have been thrown under any buses, so oh, that's no. been okay. No. What <laughs> Lucy felt just I interviewed Lucy as well. And she she was panicking, like, oh I'm so I was like, it's far, it's just a conversation. I know. She sent she sent me a message the other day and she said, I'm not sure what I said about kinky boots. I'm not sure what I said. So I said, when's it going out? Should the 8th, 8th of February? I said, it's fine, love. Whatever you've yeah. said, it's absolutely fine. Yeah. It's fine. We're due to make an announcement in 42 minutes. Oh, I'll look out for that then. Uh, um, it'll be 58 minutes on, on social media, but 42 minutes if anybody registered for the show. Ooh. Right. Tell me after... <laughs> Tell me after we stop recording. <laughs> but, yep. Richard, thank you so much for joining me. And thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of Interval Conversations.